All right, so we're recording now. If you want to shut your camera off, my feelings won't be hurt, or if you want to keep it on, that's okay too. So now I'm going to share my screen. You are here for Google, si Google Slides for instruction. So talking about how you can use it as an instructional tool. The next session will be about more about how you can use it for as a design tool. And then the third one will be like the Bitmoji classroom thing, which is kind of a little bit of both. So if you're here for all three, you'll walk away having a really good understanding of Google Slides and hopefully feel more comfortable with it. So let me share my screen. Hi. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Share screen. Google Chrome. Share. And now I can close that. I have way too many tabs open. And I'm going to go to the matrix. All of the recordings from yesterday are up for the Zoom ones and the classroom one and the file management one. If you have questions about those, don't hesitate to reach out. I will say, and it's not like me at all, but my emails are getting shorter and shorter when I'm writing back to people. I'm usually a lot um, wordier and I feel like I'm being short with you, but I'm getting so many emails right now that I don't wanna not answer. But um, so you might get an, an email that's shorter and to the point than you normally would get from me. Don't take that tone as being short with you. Just I'm trying to be fast. Okay, so you're here for teaching with Google Slides and I am going to go to this. Which one is it? <laughs> oh, the, the first one I grabbed. That's awesome. All right. Google Slides for teaching. So I'm going to go over some basics. I'm also going to be going over, let me minimize this so I can see better, um, basically how to share a deck so that you're able to have students do all the same thing at the same time in the same place, which makes it a lot easier for you. And also I'm going to explain what a master slide is. I didn't learn it until about two weeks ago. I have created a video about it that will allow you to go back and watch it again because it took a little bit for me to wrap my head around how it works, but I have a better understanding of it to be able to then tell you about it, which is way different. Understanding it yourself and then sharing it with others um, is two different things and you know that as teachers. So we're going to start off with today's video with uh, the 2020 Teachers of the Year from all over the United States. Susie, there's no volume. Okay. So that means I need to change my sound settings. See, I'm still learning. Let me rewind it before I hit play again. I have to go into my sound settings and I have to change it, I believe. system. I wonder, because today is the first day I'm using my AirPods, which I'm liking it, except for right now, obviously. Let's see. Same as the system. Let's try this. And I'll go back a page. All right. Let me know if you can hear it this time. No. <laughs> what do you mean no? Sorry, no, no hearing. <laughs> All right, let me try another one. I'll put that back here. I'll put this here. I'm fooling around on the microphone settings, just so you know. Um, can you hear that? No. Shut up. Okay. <laughs> so it's not that. I know that there was a setting that I've done before, audio settings. Let's try this. Audio. Join audio by computer, no. Use separate audio device to play ringtone, no. Well, gosh darn it. <laughs> I have way better words that I want to use right now. <laughs> um, Jennifer Amento asked, when you shared your screen, did you hit the button to share sound too? Well, let's go back and try again. Thank you, Forrest for the trees. You know, once that anxiety gets in the way, 
<laughs> I'm like hitting every button on my computer right now. All right, stop share. And then go back and hit share screen. Thank you for giving me that suggestion. Share computer sound and optimize your screen for a video clip. Let's see. Jennifer, you might be getting a prize. Amanda, thank you for watching the chat. All right, let me rewind it because I think this is going to do it. Here we go. Are you ready? Tell me. Yes. What's the best advice you've ever received from a teacher? The best advice I've ever received from a teacher is that students will often forget what I say, but they will always remember how I make them feel. And so I want to make my students feel empowered, like they can go out and save the world. You're going to hear a lot of educational vocabulary. You're going to have a lot of initiatives over the years. Always keep the kids front and center and first and foremost, and you're going to always be right. All students are gifted. And when they walk through your classroom doors, have high expectations for them and knowing that all students can learn at high levels. To look at your child's world like their oyster. Every single moment is a learning opportunity. What you focus on, you'll get more of. So focus on your students' strengths, their abilities to learn and be so incredibly thoughtful and creative. Be a reflective teacher. Don't keep doing the things that don't work. Change it up. Because the classroom is in constant motion with activity and discussion and sometimes disruptions and you always need to have a plan but be ready to deviate from that plan. Be realistic about what you can achieve with your students, with their parents, with your colleagues. Um, and remember that it is a marathon, not a sprint. I have a Why I Teach folder and I put all of my kids' notes in there, little mementos and trinkets and things uh, that bring me back to why I'm in this place. <sighs> The best advice that I've received from another teacher is to embrace mistakes, um, both your mistakes and the mistakes of your students. Failure and mistakes are incredible opportunities to learn. They need to hear the funny stories about me. They need to hear the times that I was vulnerable. And I think that really helps me connect to my students because they see me as a real person who makes mistakes and who is just like them. Just to remember that every student has a story. You know, each day a student's gonna be walking in your classroom and you don't always know what's going on, so it's so important that we build relationships with students. Every kid that steps foot in our classroom is somebody's child, and so we need to keep that in our minds. Teach kids, not curriculum. The best advice I've received as a teacher is to place an emphasis on process, not product. I really love my kids. I really want to see them be successful. Um, and because my students know that, they rise to the occasion every single day. All right, I know this week that you're probably feeling pretty stressed out and um, you kind of lose sight of what it is and why it is that you're doing what you're doing. So I thought that I would try and find videos today that kind of bring out that, that feeling of why you're here. And it's, it's not about the technology, it's not. The technology is going to become a necessary part of what we're doing, but um, it's certainly more about the kids. So hopefully with that focus, it, it bolsters you. Plus you have the next four days off. <laughs> That'll bolster you too. All right. So this is going to be um, a lot of you watching what I'm doing. You're welcome to have slides open if you want to and listen and follow along, or you can just watch me. Like I said, this is getting recorded. You can watch it again later, um, whatever works for you. So I'm not going to be showing you any videos, but let me jump into the Google Doc for a second. Teach with Google Slides. I'm going to show you what's in here and then you can explore these either. I don't, we'll see how much time we have. Um, Mr. Spark is a site that Lucinda shared. It has amazing templates in there that are designed to be interactive. And so after today, you'll have a good idea of how to design them. But thank you to Lucinda for sharing that. I have never seen it and now I'm in love. Teachers pay teachers. Um, somebody said yesterday, teachers not paying teachers. I don't like teachers pay teachers because I don't like to pay for those things, but there's a lot of free stuff in there. And I don't just use the free stuff so I can use it. I use it so I can learn how to make what they made. It's almost like they're giving you a blueprint of how to do it yourself. So try to look at it with that eye when you're in there not shopping. <laughs> Slides for teaching. Um, this one is a YouTube video that you can kind of watch how a teacher uses Google Slides to make like a choice box. I think there were like six 
boxes in her choice and she also gives you a template that's already built. You just customize it for yourself. Um, down here, this video was made by me. I'm gonna go over it today, but if you wanna watch it again, you can either watch this video again or you can watch that video because I might say it differently and hearing it two different ways is always helpful. And now I know it better than I did when I made that video. And then let's see, slides, go ahead. Is someone have, someone have a question? I yep. think um, the people at QuashNet are getting very, very blurry screens, mm -hmm. but the MMA guests are just completely clear. Okay. Um, and I'm... Chrissy Mayer tried to turn it off, her video, her own video I suggested, and turned it back on and no change. No change in what they're seeing. Yeah, it's still blurry for her, but Chris, by Katie McBrien says it's better now. Okay. I wish I could help with that. Um, unless you guys want to sit like in some of the same rooms, of course, you know, six feet apart, and maybe watch on the same device or on a clear touch that might work. You don't have to try it in this session, but maybe in the next one, maybe that will ha help. Um, we're definitely figuring out how this whole system will work. And I'm sharing with Sean as I go along how we're doing and what we're getting. And I'm noticing even the recordings that I do are a little choppy. I think I sound great, but when I listen to it back, I'm like, oh wow, it, I didn't realize that it was choppy at times. So we're, we're keeping track of it and hopefully it will get better. Um, Slides Carnival, a lot of people know about that. It is a website with a gabillion free slides templates. And then um, I love Casey Bell from Shake Up Learning. Like I've said, she's the emoji with the big blonde ponytail. And so that's an article that has some ideas on how to use Google Slides um, as a teaching tool. So I'm gonna jump into Google Slides. And what I thought I would do, oh my goodness, I have so many things open. What I thought I would do is kind of work through um, building an online, activity that you could then decide how to use it in your own setting. So for me, I don't very often use the themes that are on the right hand side, but you'll probably recognize some of them because a lot of us use them. I've used this one many times, um, but you are welcome to use those. Every time you click on one of these themes on the right, it obviously changes your slide. But it also, if you go up here to the add a new slide and you click the little tiny down arrow, you'll see these are all the master slides that come with that theme. So you'll see that they have different colors and different things to choose from, where if you change the design, it will change the masters. So that's how they create almost like a, a set, stationary set like you'd buy at the store and it would come with like three different things and they're all matchy poo poo, same idea. So some people like to use these. If you go to Slides Carnival, there's a gabillion more of them. And then they just insert right into your Google Slides presentation and you can use those as well. I'm not gonna use a actual theme. I'm gonna stay with the basic theme, which comes with its own set of master slides, which are boring. They're just regular, normal old slides, but that's what I'm gonna start with. So I'm gonna close my themes on the right so I have a little bit more room on my screen. So the first one is always this click to add title, click to add subtitle. I almost never use what they give me. So I like to get it out of the way right away. And there's two ways, well, there's many ways you can do all of this stuff, but two ways you can get rid of it. One is to drag your mouse across it so that they're both selected and then I can hit delete or control Z, I'll put it back in there. Or you can click on the actual frame and then you can hit delete and it will get rid of each one. A lot of people will click where the words are and try and delete it and it won't go anywhere. So you have to make sure you're clicking on the actual frame of it to be able to delete it. So that's that sometimes is a game changer for folks. So what I wanna to create today is something that all of my students can get in and use at the same time. So I'm gonna first insert just basically the image that I'm using as an idea. And I have it on my phone, but I want you to be able to see it. And I can't remember, no, that's not it. Yes, go ahead. 
question kind of in relation to this from Mary, um, Mary Russell. How do you take part of the slide and make more than one column? How do okay. you take part of a slide and make more than one column? I can show you a couple of ways to do that. Let me get my little thing in here. All right. I was on Instagram and I'll show you that in a second. I'll make a new slide and show you. So I was on Instagram and I saw this idea from teacher to teacher that creates a slide where students can introduce themselves. So they'd type their name here and tell about themselves. They could put a video from YouTube that would be their walk on song, a picture of themselves and down here their favorite quote. So I took a screenshot of this just as inspiration. I'm gonna leave it as my first slide and I'll delete it later once I'm done designing, but I have it there to remind me of all of the elements that I wanna put in it. So now I'm gonna start by creating a new slide. I'm gonna go up here. I could just hit plus and it'll put in what they believe I need for my next slide, but I'm gonna use the down arrow and I'm gonna to go to a blank slide. So you have two choices. If you wanna put things in three columns, you can insert a grid. Uh, what do you mean, uh, not a grid, a table? And you can say you want to do a three by one table. And then you can come in here and you can stretch it out and use it that way. Or you can just arrange anything on your slide wherever you want it. And you don't have to worry about having a grid like you do in Google Docs. That's why I know that creating these landing pages is a lot easier in slides than it is in Google Docs. And you'll see as I go through why that's true. But that's how you can do three columns is to go into, I went to insert and I went to table and then you drag across how many little squares you need. And I did a three by one. So that's how I got the three columns. So that's, that's how you can do that. So I'm going to delete that slide by clicking on it and hitting my delete key. So I'm back to my inspiration slide. So it looks like if I'm trying to recreate it, they have a background. And then they have all of these text boxes and they've created um, the background as a light color, the frame as a dark color. Um, they've included places for students to put text. So they're all gonna be um, customized once the student gets a hold of it. So what I need to do as a teacher is I need to make that first slide that's gonna be the first one in the slideshow, but then I'll be replicating it so that students can then each be assigned one like, hey, Susie, you'll be number two. And, You'll be number three, Amanda. My students always had numbers, so they always knew when they came into a slideshow, if they were student 18, they went to slide 18. So it was something that was very common for them to do. They were used to doing it, and they each had their own space to show me what they were doing. And I could watch them work all in one document while they were working. I could see their progress as they went along. All right, so now I'm gonna start a new slide. So I'm gonna go to a blank slide and this is going to be kind of like my template or what I'm going to call a master slide and it's going to be replicated several times down the slide presentation and I don't want my kids messing around with it so anything I'm creating now is kind of like the background so I'm going to need a background first I'm going to go into insert and I am going to go to image they're doing some training here in the library. I don't know if you can hear them in the background or not. And I could upload from my computer or I could search the web. If it does search the web, you'll see that the search box shows up here over on the right hand side. And let's say I want to have, it had bubbles on it, so I'll write bubbles. See what comes up. So funny. A shame that we have no fun at school. <laughs> it's okay. I said it's a shame that you have fun at school. <laughs> Sorry, Susie. All right, so I got my bubbles in there. Um, I think that they're too bright. I'm going to stretch them across my whole screen. So it, there we go. So it does the whole background. There we go. And then I actually, if I want to, I can change the way that it looks. So I got to move my face out of the way. I'm in my own way here format options and I want to have it be a little bit more transparent so I'm going to drag this across that way it's not so bright it'll kind of fade to the background so there we go so now I have 
background for my slide. And the next thing I'm going to do is put in some text boxes. So what's cool about Google Slides is that everything is its own object. Think of Google Slides as like a room. You know, how like I'm trying to think how to put this. Like I know that when I'm getting ready to move a room around or if I'm planning a arrangement of furniture in my room, I want to kind of do it in my head or on paper to know that everything's going to fit. And so with Google Slides, if you think of Google Slides as your empty room, and then everything you put in it is a piece of furniture, and then you, you can drag your furniture wherever you want it to go. If you're trying to do that in Google Docs, chances are that you are going to bump words around, things are going to move on you every time you shift stuff, and it's frustrating. It won't happen in Google Slides. Each one operates independently of each other. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to insert a text box. I'm going to put this in. And I'm going to say name. This is not going to be fancy because I don't have the time to do all of it and show all of it to you, but I want them to be able to put their name in there. And then I'm going to want them to put in insert text box. Um, we said that they were going to do their favorite quote. My little name got all yucky on me. And then also I'm going to insert one and I'm going to do another text box that's going to be their walk-on song. I could put the other elements in there. If I go back to my thing, I know that I have other elements. But right now I'm just getting the basics in there. I'll change the font probably afterwards. But right now my box is pretty big and I cannot see the frame around it. It's invisible when I click away from it. But if I want it to be visible up here, I can go to the border and do the border weight and I can make it thicker. So now it's a thicker border. And if I click away, now it has a border. My walk on song, I'll also give that a border. Oh, that's a thicker one. I forgot what number I used already <laughs> from two seconds ago. Whoops, this one. Eight. Now I can also change the color if I want to. So I can go up here and I can do my border color, might be like a dark teal and then the inside of my thing might want to be uh, the light color. So there we go. Go ahead, Amanda. Um, from Mara Burchill, when I add a text box, it is not transparent. How do I do that? You add a text box, it's not transparent. It should be when it first comes in. But if it's not, then you can come up here to where the fill color is. When you have it selected, make sure it has the little boxes around it. And you come up here to where the fill color is, and then you can click transparent, and then it should be see-through. So hopefully that helps. So I know mine is ugly right now. I would need more time to make it pretty like my example that's here, but I've changed the inside of the box. I've changed the frame. I've put my text in. I can change the font if I want to. Love you like a sister is my favorite right now. <laughs> and now I could just duplicate the slide and say, okay, kids, you know, go into your numbered slide and I want you to type in these boxes, but chances are they'd probably mess up something. What I want is to make basically what I've created to be the master slide so that they can't mess with where the box is. They can't erase all of this stuff that I've put in here and worked so hard on. All they would do is just add their own information in there instead. So this is where it gets a little bit um, not tricky, but this is what I had a hard time wrapping my head around. So I'm going to go in here. I'm going to do view and I'm going to do master. So remember back when I was at the plus and I hit the little down arrow and it showed the different types of slides I could put in. These are those different types of slides. So I'm going to actually create a new master blank slide so that when I insert a blank slide, it's not going to be blank. It's going to look like this. So what I'm going to do is select all of this by doing my command A, like select all. 
So now I pretend command A, there's no fireworks or parades. It's in the, it's in my like clipboard. I'm gonna go back to view and master. And I'm gonna go to that blank slide. So now I'm in the blank master slide and I'm going to vomit or paste it all in there. Wait a minute, I didn't copy it right. <laughs> awesome. Let me go back. Control A. Control C. Or Command C, not Control. View. Master. I'm on the blank one. Vomit. Go ahead, Amanda. There we go. How do you type in the box? I just have the little cross and can't get the straight line, so I can type in the box from Mary. All right. Excellent question. You have to drag your box across. Let me go back out. When you do insert text box, you get the little plus sign. You need to drag it to make a text box. And when you let go, then you get the little blinky to type in. Good question. Let me delete that. So I know that what I just did might not make sense to you yet, but now let's say I have this awesome slide and I want to be able to duplicate it down. But what's cool is that, let me go here. One of my choices now, because I just glued everything in, is a new blank slide that looks the same as the first one. So I'm going to click on it. And when I'm in there, <laughs> I'm facing the window in the hallway. When I'm in there, you can see now I can't move anything. It's almost become like a photograph and the kids can't move anything, they can't click on anything, they can't touch anything. So it's almost created like a background for me now to build on. I'm gonna stop for a second because I know that's a big thing. Yes. It's Mary Russell. Can you do oh. that one more time? Yes, I absolutely will. So let me go in here. I'm gonna do control Z to get rid of what I did. All right. So I've created my first slide that's designed the way that I want it to be. It basically is done and it's perfect. I've spent way more time on it than I just did in front of you. I'm going to want to copy all of this to a master slide that I can then replicate several times in my slide presentation so every student gets one and they can't mess with what I made. So I'm first going to select all by doing Command A or Control A. You can see now I have all of the, um, the little blue things have come up around and I'm going to copy it. Command C or Control C. So now it's copied on my clipboard. I'm going to go to my view and I'm going to go to master. And what I was doing was creating a new blanks master slide. So let me um, delete all of that delete all of that. Normally that's what a blank slide would look like, but I want to create a new master. So I'm going to, because I've copied it, I'm going to vomit it onto the screen. So now it's now the new master slide for a blank slide. Thanks. You're welcome. When I go back to the slideshow and I go to add a new slide, it's now a choice. I've just made a new template basically or a new master slide so when I go in I can now use this oops wait a minute this is it here I'm going to delete this one so now I can use this to build off of okay so now I'm going to make it interactive for my students I want to be able to have them type their name in so I'm going to insert a text box and stretch it across and I'm going to leave it blank, but I can make it obvious for them and say type here. And then I want their quote to go in here. So I'm going to insert a text box. I'm going to put it right inside there and I'm going to write type here. And then I'm going to go to insert text box and I'm going to put it here and I'm going to say insert video here. Now now it's ready. It's ugly as sin right now. And I didn't make my box big enough to insert a video. There's a lot of things that need work in here. But 
if I want to then duplicate this slide, I can go up to slide, duplicate. Now I have two of them. I could say, okay, kid number two, this is your slide. Kid number three, this is your slide. And now when they go in, they can't get rid of the word quote. Like that's not budging. I can't click on a frame. I can't click, I can't get rid of that, but I can type here and put in my favorite quote, whatever it is. I can erase the text that the teacher put in there and put my own in. And let's say you had format, um, sorry, no slide, duplicate, duplicate, slide, duplicate. You would do this before you started typing in there. But let's say I have 20 students, I can then go in and watch and see what they're doing while they're working on it. It's a way for me to see that activity, whether they're sitting in front of me or across the hall or they're at home, I can see what they're working on. It doesn't have to be while you're on Zoom. It doesn't have to be while you have anything recording. It can just be a way that you're monitoring what they're doing. The best part about this is that every slide has this area at the bottom for speaker notes. I'm going to bring the slide up. So now if you wanted your students to be able to write about what they're doing or answer a question or respond to literature, let's say you weren't doing an introductory slide, you were doing, you know, like let's find evidence of how the character shows fear and maybe they have to, you know, pull a quote from the story and maybe they have to find a song or a video that demonstrates that. They put all of that media up here but then down here, you have them type all about the things that you want them to say. So you now still can go from slide to slide to slide and see what it is that they're doing. This area down here is often underutilized as a teaching tool. It's designed to be for the speaker so the speaker knows what they're going to say in a PowerPoint. But as a teaching tool, it's a great place to put your students writing so that you're looking all in one place and like I said it's all happening live at the same time. I'm going to pause for a second. Susie there's a question from Jen Blackburn. Do okay. students still delete change each other's work? It is part of one presentation? It is so part of the culture that you'll build um, will be that you don't do that. <laughs> not to mention, if I were to go to view, I'm not view, file, and then go to version history, I will know who did what. So if I go into see version history, I'd be able to look over here and I'd be able to see who made those changes. And so then I would know who to squish. So you're setting up that culture of, you know, respect and uh, how you want things to be done. You can also differentiate in how you create your slides. You might create three different slide decks and you share them with three different groups of students so that you can change what it is that they're doing. If you don't want to put all 20 students in the same slide deck, you don't have to. From Terry Bond, is there a way to populate the speaker notes with a prompt on each slide? Um, yes. So before you duplicate any of your slides, your first slide that you make, you want it to be perfect and ready to go. So if I did here, put, oops, prompt here, and then I duplicate this slide, slide, duplicate slide. Now both of them, I'm clicking on each of them, have the same prompt in the notes area. So do whatever you're going to do with your first slide get it exactly the way you want it, and then duplicate it. Good question. Keep them coming. From Anne-Marie Finn, is this what they mean by a slide deck? Yes. Yes, it is. <laughs> I'm going to check the chat too, only because I know sometimes people send them privately to me and Amanda wouldn't be able to see that. So give me a second to pull that up. I can't tell you what a difference it feels like today having two helpers, someone to do the doorbell and someone to monitor the chat. Amanda, is it making it harder for you to learn to do that? No, no. I think to be honest, it would be best to have one of your students who maybe gets distracted to give them this job. 
because I think it mm-hmm. focuses you more to realize yep. like this is what I'm looking to do right now. We have a question from Hannah McCarthy. How do you set the Google Slides to prompt that students make their own copy when they open it? That's a great question. It is here up in the um, address, I believe. And I have to, I would have to Google it to make sure. And I will Google it when I have a minute and I'll make a video for it. But it's in the address itself if I copy and vomit down here. It's at the end here. It's like adding the word edit or it's adding the word copy. It's something to that effect and then oh see how it says edit here it would be the word that you change and then that link becomes what you share with your students and it will prompt them to create a copy without even having a choice but i'll double check how to do that and i'll make a quick video about how to do it what's the difference between a background and a master slide from jill hill Okay, so a, ma- a background, and you're right, because I kind of made the bubbles um, just a big image. I didn't make it a background. Let me do a new slide. Let me drag down my speaker notes and delete it. All right, so if I were to go into, I can't remember if it's format. Where is it? Background. Someone can save me if they can remember where it is, because I'm anxiety is saying Susie where is it where is it Susie do you know where it is you're supposed to know all this gonna love the voice in your head it's right below there um next go, to under the slides. go again change background is that what you want yeah oh I you can I can right click if I right click in there I believe that I, yeah, there we go. So if you right click in your slide, which on a Chromebook is two fingers, the Mac is probably two fingers, then you can go into change background. There we go. And then you can either change it to a color or you can change it to an image that you can find from 8 million different places, or you can reset it to whatever the theme is. Thank you. I'm glad that you asked that question. So to then finish answering your question, a background is something that's glued to the background. It's a photograph. A lot of people are using them for their Bitmoji classrooms because you don't want the the brick wall to slide. Um, But hang hang on one second. I'm getting feedback. Okay. So you don't want the um, background to move. The background can be used in your master. I probably should have done that with my bubbles instead of using a photograph. It just would have been easier to have it be the background. Um, So I could have done the picture bubbles and stretched it out, or I could have inserted the bubbles as a background. Either way, you can still then go on to the next step and use it to create a master slide. And if this whole master slide thing is like blowing your mind and you still can't wrap your mind around it, like I said, I only learned it two weeks ago and I've been using slides forever. Um, you can do everything without making a master slide. Just know that your students might be able to click on some of your text boxes. Or, hang on, let me think this through. If I created a slide with a background and it had text boxes in it, if I insert a text box and I want it to be something that they cannot touch, what I could do is go to file. Oops, crap go back there we go sorry so you create this amazing thing it has a beautiful background you've put the things in you don't want your students to touch like this then you go to file and you can do download as a jpeg just that slide and it will make a picture of the whole background that's another way to do it if the whole idea of a master slide is just blowing your mind at this point So then once you make it a JPEG, then nobody can touch anything that you've just downloaded as a picture. And then you can upload it as a new background for your slide and then build on top of that. I know what I'm saying is, woo. So if it's something that's not sinking in yet, don't expect it to, it's okay if it's not. It's more the concept of it that hopefully will sink in and then you'll be like, oh wait, could I use this to do that? Yeah, you probably could. Couple more questions. Go um, for it. From, can you make more than one slide in a presentation a JPEG, and will the two slides still be linked? 
Yes. So um, I could use different backgrounds or different types of slides. Like I don't have to do 20 of the same one. I could do each student could have two different slides that they have to work in and maybe one has this stuff and one has this stuff. And so it doesn't all have to be the same all the way down. I don't know if that's answering the question. If it's not, go ahead and clarify so I can. I just meant because on my landing page, I'm going to want to make it a, a JPEG, but then uh, mm -hmm. it also connects to a second slide. So okay. uh, like I have my contact information on a second slide. So um, I just wanted to know if they could still be connected. That's a good question. So you're saying if you make it a JPEG, will the link still work? Is that yes. what you mean? Yes. They, they won't. Okay. If it's a JPEG, the links won't work. If you go up and you um, go to file and then you export it or download it as a PDF instead, uh -huh. the links will work. You okay. also could publish it to the web and that will make it, I'll show you. Um, and actually I did a video on this that, um, I did a video on this that I'll share also that shows how to do this and why you would do it. But what it will do is it will make it nice and big. I'll do publish. Oh, I have to go up here and do okay. It'll give you a new link, copy. And then if I vomit that link, it will make my slide huge, like a full screen, like a web page. So that then if it's only one slide, it won't move. But because I have a bunch of slides, it's moving every time I click. But that way, everything would still work. If you had links, they would work. If you had embedded videos, they would work. If you had moving things on it, they would move. So that's another way that you can share it. But like I said, there's a video that I created on that that I will make sure that I share probably um, in the next class. I, or the Bitmoji class, because it was a question about a Bitmoji. Let me go back to here. Go ahead, Amanda. If I already made my whole virtual classroom and didn't do that, will it mm -hmm. mess everything if I try it now? I think it, you might have just answered it, but I'm not sure. Um, if you created it in slides and you decide to publish it as a web page or download it as a PDF, Anything that you're going to download, it's only going to be the most recent version. But if you're publishing it as a web page, that last example I just showed, then any changes you make to your slide presentation will automatically go to that published link. You won't ever have to worry about changing that published link again. And if you've created it all in Google Docs, it's not going to work to the same extent that Google Slides does because you can't publish it as a web page. I don't believe I'd have to double check that. Don't hold me to it. So if I publish it as a web page, the students can't mess with it anyway. Right. It's something more that they either watch or they can click on the things that you have in there. It becomes more like a web page than a interactive Google slide presentation that they can do work in. It just depends on your purpose. You're all caught up on questions right now. I was just going to say it's 1049. We're getting close to that 10 minutes of. Um, I did mention earlier that I'm going to announce in all of these classes today. If you have something that you've like learned to do or that you know that you're decent at doing or good at doing, you probably think you're not that great, but I'm going to say you are. Um, I'm going to have this 10 minute period in the next week be like little commercials where if you are willing to share a tool or something that you've been using or something that you find to be useful, especially the things that I haven't been able to cover in 28 classes, um, reach out to me. You can either make a screencastify and I'll just hit play and people can watch it if they want to stay for those 10 minutes. Or if you want to be here live in person, I will make you a co-host and you have 10 minutes to share. I'm trying not to ask anyone to do anything that's beyond what you're trying to do already, but I know that there are so many of you that are kicking butt at doing some of this stuff, and I would love it if you were willing to share. I just don't want to put more on you than you already have. So I'll put that in my um, little morning email tomorrow morning, just to, tomorrow's Friday though. I don't think I'm going to do an email tomorrow morning. Maybe I'll do one at the end of the day today, but um, 
consider doing it. I think it would be awesome if you are using a tool and you're adept at it and other people can take it in a quick bite. I would be happy to share. Um, she said, I made a slideshow about it. Yay. I would love that. I would love that. So I could spend hours and I am going to spend three hours in slides today. But slides is such a um, versatile tool that if you still feel like, you know, obviously I can't teach you all that much in 45 minutes, but going back to this document and checking out some of those links is definitely worth checking out, especially um, this one here, the slides for teachers, a template for you. What she shows is really simple, but if you can wrap your mind around how you can use it as a teacher, I think that using her template template is a great start. And like I said, this one here goes through the whole master slag thing again, that I just tried to explain. And I'm getting better and better at understanding it and explaining it. But if you need more help, let me know. And then again, up here, the stuff that Lucinda shared is awesome. Awesome, awesome. All right. Does anyone have any questions? I'm going to stop recording. Actually, I'm gonna, let me stop sharing for a second too. Hi, all right, and stop recording.